Welcome everybody to Antil's latest webinar in our Undy Empire webinar series, Five Fast Ways to Grow Your Business with Simon Reynolds. My name is James Tuckerman and I will be your moderator today. Now, before we get started, while the late comers continue to shuffle into their virtual seats, um, I'd like to show you how to interact, how you can interact with us today. At the side of your screen, you will see a question box. Yes, you will see a question box. We'll be having a Q&A at the end, but we'll also be inviting participation and interaction throughout today's uh, webinar. So let's test this out. While, uh, while people still continue to get on the line, I'd like you to have some fun with me. Here's what I'd like for you to do for me today, early birds. I'd like you to use the question pane to share with me your favorite nugget of business wisdom. Okay, now I'm talking about a saying that you might use that's short and sweet, a nugget, to keep you on track or maybe to motivate you or maybe to guide staff. Uh, for example, I once had a sales director who would say, when on a roll, don't stop rolling. And uh, obviously when he, uh, when he was on a roll, he often would stop rolling. He'd probably go out for a long lunch. And uh, last night I was watching a video about Domino's Pizza and a franchise owner said, big is not better, better is better. And I thought that was very cool. Uh, here they are. They're starting to come in. Vicky Rabi, less is more. Very true. Dale Hansen, just get out there and do it. You're obviously a Nike fan. Greg Standard, if it's to be, it's up to me. Who said that? Who said that? Uh, Jordan Mullen, failing to plan is planning to fail. So true. Adam Coates, oh gee, now they're moving fast. Jackie Taylor, better to be, teacher, better to be teachable than to know everything. Yes, uh, my, one of my personal favorites is the greatest lesson in business is to never stop learning. Josh Gollum because says, make sure you have finished speaking before your audience has finished listening. Well, that's probably advice that, <laughs> that I could take. Adam Coates before said, if you're not going forwards, you're going backwards. Um, there's a lot there and they're flying in. Um, that's just fantastic. I, I gotta say, gee, Antillians are smart. Uh, I think in our first webinar, I asked what underpants you were wearing. Today, I get a wealth of wisdom. Brilliant. Um, and do you know what I'm also thinking? I'm also thinking that I might turn all that into a topic forum or a blog post or, or an ebook because there are so many. But now if there's one thing that all of these sayings have in common, it's that they were born from experience. Uh, my sales director knew that after a sale he'd lose focus and get slack. The Domino's franchisee had obviously sacrificed quality for size at some time and he paid for it. Today we're privileged to be joined by a man who has been around the block a few times and has amassed an amazing wealth of experiences. In fact, almost every decade he seems to reinvent himself. The name Simon Reynolds is already familiar to most business builders in Australia. From 2008 until 2011, Simon was chairman of OMG, Australia's largest group of websites which currently runs over about 31,000 sites. Uh, OMG, I believe, is currently in the process of being acquired by Fairfax Media. Ooh, uh, ooh, uh. And uh, prior to these companies, Simon was responsible for several successful ad agencies and some amazing ad campaigns. He has won Advertising Agency of the Year twice, as well as over 50 industry awards, including TV Commercial of the Year, Magazine Ad of the Year, Newspaper Ad of the Year, and the Golden Lion at the Cannes International Advertising Festival. Yes, you probably, um, anyone, anyone on the line, I'm sure, did anyone ever see the Grim Reaper AIDS campaign in the 1990s? Anyone want to yell out and say, yes, I saw that? Because I am sure you did. That was Simon and it was an industry game changer. Vicky has just said, absolutely. Of course you have. If you're, uh, if you're over the age of 30, there is absolutely no doubt that you would have seen that advertising campaign. His most recent business, uh, the Photon Group, started with two people in 2000 and seven years later employed over 6,000 staff in 14 countries. The group consisted of 54 companies and was valued on the ASX at over $500 million. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know many Australians that have grown companies worth over $500 million. In fact, I would have trouble counting them on, uh, on one hand. Um, 
ideally wanted to call this webinar, Five Fast Ways to Grow Your Business by the guy who built a $500 million business consisting over 50 companies employing over 5,000 staff in five years, but it took Simon seven years, so it ruined my five. Talk about letting the team down. Um, in today's uh, live interactive webinar, webinar, Simon promises to reveal what he believes are five of the fastest ways to build a business, and if anyone knows he should, and some of the common dumbest business traps that slow businesses down. Welcome our special guest, Simon Reynolds. Well, thanks for having me, James, and hi to everybody. I really appreciate you actually making the time. I know there's a million other things like tasty sandwiches and and meat pies with sauce that you could be eating now, but um, you've chosen to be here and I really appreciate that. And you, you're I'll getting try and make it as value packed as possible. You're getting a virtual round of applause here at the moment. People are clap, clap, clapping and like hellos and <laughs> hoorahs. I've got to thank you, Simon, because because um, listeners won't know this, but Simon is currently in New York. It is ten o'clock at night. Um, it's our Undie Empire webinar series, but I hope you're wearing some pajamas. And uh, and looking out at well, the Empire State Building. I was building. just in a towel. What's that? I was just in a towel, and, and just in case someone <laughs> turned the camera on, I put a shirt on. So. Great, like those sportscasters in their in their in their basketball shorts <laughs> under the desk. Um, I'll 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 uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Simon. Beautiful, well, awesome, guys. And look, uh, you know, just before I get into the my my five rules for for today. I, I thought I'd start out by by saying this for anybody on the call who may kind of feel that uh, yeah we're going for this we're going to open our business or we're gonna, you know we've started our business but might have a little bit of a feeling deep down that they can't do it. I just want to say the following fa facts about me. I uh, started out very badly at school. Uh, literally, I'll never forget. After almost twelve years of school. My headmaster tried to get rid of me in the last six months, uh, so he, he just thought, you know, that I, w I was not uh, uh, <laughs> equipped for an academic life, and he was right. I, di I didn't go to university. Uh, I three weeks after uh, s finishing school, I was working full time at a at a at a job in in Kings Cross in in Sydney, and as a as a junior in an ad agency for under ten thousand dollars a year. And, and pretty much uh, never did any education since then. I've lectured at four universities, but I've, I've never done any education. So number one, I was bad at school. Number two, I didn't go to uni. Uh, and, and number three, I had no particular uh, financial aptitude. You know, I couldn't read a balance sheet. Uh, I, I, I couldn't do much. Um, but you know, we, as, as James was saying, you know, I and, and along with with my partners, you know, we we're able to to build a, a pretty big business. So I guess what I want to say first off is, if you're feeling a bit like that, if you're feeling a little unsure about your road forward, don't worry. Uh, you know, if I can do it, uh, you can do it. Because I, I bet I, I uh, uh, had probably a, um, a a less auspicious start than you did. And I'll, I'll never forget the words of Brian Tracy, who I'm a bit of a fan of. Uh, he's almost 70 now, but he's a great guy. If you want to read some, some great business and motivation books, Brian Tracy's a uh, good guy. And I remember I was struck by something he wrote, which was very, very simple, and it was this, that all business skills are learnable. All business skills are learnable. We're not dealing with astrophysics. We're not dealing with quantum mechanics. This is relatively simple stuff, not easy to master, but relatively simple and methodical to learn. So don't be don't be psyched out by the jargon of business, by the the apparent complexity. It's uh, it's learnable. And uh, I want to give two quick examples, if if I I could, uh, James, before I get into my five points. And the first is, and not many people know this, that uh, apparently Richard Branson was 50 before he knew the difference between a net profit and a gross profit. And uh, apparently it was evident in a board meeting, and one of the members of the board took him to the side and said, you don't, you don't know what this is, do you? And he said, well, look, I'm not exactly sure. And he said, well, Richard, how you remember it is that uh, you pretend you're fishing, and anything that's still left in the net is what you get to keep. And that's how Richard Branson, already a billionaire, learnt the difference between net and gross profit. So don't worry too much if you don't know too much. At this point, you probably know more than 
than he did. It, and the it other took, it example, took me, it took me. I'm just going to say, it took me five years to work out what ROI meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How's and, that? You know, that? I thought I knew, these, but then I didn't know. <laughs> Exactly right, and there's so much jargon and and stuff, you know, uh, uh, that the academics put into business, and we we must remember that business is about selling a profit or service, as uh, selling a uh, product or service at a profit, and that's about it. And there ain't much more that you need to be good at. And uh, you know, my my other example is my brother, who is a very high level uh, barrister. He told me this story. He had this guy come in, and this guy was in the BRW 200, and, and he's now a billionaire. And I can't say his name just for confidentiality reasons. And each he, he was in a court case, and my brother was advising him. And my brother noticed that each time that he gave him a, a piece of paper, that the meeting would soon end. And uh, what he realised after a while, now remember, this guy's a billionaire, is that he couldn't read. And he's currently right near the top of the BRW 200 list. So don't worry, guys. Whatever you know, it's more than most successful business people know for a start. All right. So let's get on to uh, the, my fir the first of my points. And I'm going to talk about uh, raising big startup capital. Now, you might have already raised uh, a little capital or no capital. Uh, you may not aspire to raise big startup capital, but I'm just going to tell you how I got to a business that was worth 500 million. And one of the primary ways is I raised five million bucks to start off with. And I just want to talk a bit about how to do that. If you want to raise a larger amount of money, and I call anything above 50 grand a, a larger amount of money. I'll give you a few thoughts on this. The first is to, as much as you can, to pick a fast growth sector. Because what I've noticed is that investors tend to fall for sectors. Now, I'm going to say something a bit later about this. It doesn't really matter which sector you get in, in general. But when you want to get a lot of startup capital, you want to have a, a, a sector that looks like it's going fast. So uh, that's number one. And you'd be amazed, in many ways, the sector does the work when you get investments. You, you'll find, you know, I've been involved in a number of things behind the scenes, and I saw uh, a company raise about a million dollars to open an online shoe store. And by the way, they, they closed down this company, which will remain nameless. But um, how did they raise a million dollars in this market so quickly to open an online shoe store? It's because people had seen Zappos do well. And, and you would say, oh, aren't investors more intelligent than this? Just to pick, uh, just to invest in someone because Zappos had, had done well? And the answer is no, they're seduced by sectors. So you want to pick a fast growth sector if, if you can, if you want to raise capital. And I'll talk a bit about sectors a bit later. Second thing is ask for a lot. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't need much capital, I'll just get a little bit. Well, I'm the opposite. If you can raise a lot, then ask for a lot. And for several reasons why. The, the first is uh, that you're going to have enormous momentum. You can have all this cash and you'll be able to build quick momentum. And that's really important. Uh, the second thing is, uh, it gives you an immediate profit. So when I raise my, my money, and you, you will probably not be able to get this deal because I was well known in advertising and, and therefore was able to, to dictate these terms, but I raised five million and I, I still ended up with 48.5% of the company. Now, you don't have to be a genius at maths to see that in a series of meetings over, say, four weeks, I made $2.5 million, didn't I, or just below $2.5 million, uh, without putting any money in. Why? Because I now owned uh, half of a company with $5 million in capital. So when you uh, raise a lot of money, you uh, often end up, your slice may be 20%, 30%, but it tends to be worth much more money. And what I realized is as long as I don't lead, lose this money, then I've made a few million out of this deal. And people don't talk about that much. And then finally, I think that um, uh, you get a lot of excitement about a company that, that raises uh, a lot of money and a lot of people want to join you. And, and that kind of, that kind of um, uh, people growth and top quality people growth is, is pretty valuable as well. Uh, next part of raising big startup capitals, uh, capital. What you've got to do, guys, is, is you've got to really look at comparable valuations. So you should try and find examples of other companies 
that do similar things to what you do a few years later or five years later or, or ten years later that are now worth a lot. You see, what you, even though you're dealing with intelligent people, what you're really selling is the story of success. So you guys have got to find a lot of examples of companies that have done similar things to you or somewhat related things to you and are now worth a lot of money. And the more comparables you can find, the more convinced a lot of investors will be that you're going to become one of those, as, as semiological as it, as it is. Next, get competition for your investment. So what do I mean by that? Well, one of the reasons I was able to get such a good deal on my raising was I told them, and it was true, that I had someone else who was ready to put the money in. And as a result of that, they couldn't push too hard on the deal. Now, you know, when I was raising money, it was in 2000, so um, uh, the market was much more buoyant than, than it is now. But you still want to create an element of scarcity, an element of competition inside your raising. The last thing you can do, even if you're only raising 30,000 bucks, is give the impression that no one else wants to put the money in. And time and time again, I see people doing that. And no one likes uh, someone who's yes. needy. Yeah, precisely. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like, well, if you need me, I don't need you. You know, it's like a Groucho Marx club. I, I don't want to uh, quote. I don't want to join a club that would have <laughs> me as a member. But, you know, a lot of a lot of people don't want to be associated with with something that other people uh, don't look interested in. Um, and I don't. And I don't mind saying. I just. I don't mind saying that as in the position that I am in, in Antioch, we get a phone call about once a day, maybe every second day. Usually at about five thirty, someone who's looking to raise money. The first thing is at 5.30, which means they've obviously left it to the last moment, so it can't be that important, not much their side thing. And the second thing, they all sound so needy and desperate. Um, yeah. What's, what's wrong with a 9 a.m. meeting where, where you, you need to be out of there by 9.30? It's, a, it's a, a far more persuasive approach. Precisely. And, and in many ways, uh, you should be giving the impression that you're interviewing them. Mm. So that they're on the back foot, and that they feel, oh, you know, I've got to justify uh, why I should I should invest in this. Two quick books for you to read. Uh, one is called uh, Enterprise and Venture Capital by Chris Scholas. I used to go home and re study this book to try and learn what to say the next day at the next meeting to raise <laughs> five million bucks. So I didn't know how to. I, at that time, I didn't know how to raise capital. Enterprise and Venture Capital, very good book. And the other one is a book. Uh, by a guy with the surname of Olaf, O L A W F, called Pitch Anything. Brilliant book. Mm. Yeah, you love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, speak, he does a great chapter on not being needy, <laughs> uh, as well as other things, and getting your uh, positioning your frame, uh, positioning yourself as the as as uh, as the dom as a, a the alpha in the situation that you're in. All sorts of crazy stuff. One of the best pitching books I've ever read, I think, if not the best. Yeah. Yeah, extremely, uh, extremely valuable, worth, worth a fortune. I totally agree. Okay, so then my first, uh, that's, that's the first way that I got to 500 million. I raised big startup capital. You don't have to do it, I'm just telling you how I did it. The second way is uh, we, uh, we started some companies, but we bought a lot of companies, right? And one of the, you know, one of the best things you can do is, as soon as you've got enough money to do it, is to, to buy companies. So if you look at the 54 companies in our group, probably, uh, you know, I don't know, about 45 of them were actually acquired. Now, once again, you may not choose this road. I'm not saying you should cho chose, uh, choose this road. I'm just telling you that it's a fast way to, to build a business if you intelligently buy companies. Anyway, sometime in your career, you'll probably have the opportunity to buy a company. So let me take you uh, through a few uh, different thoughts uh, about that. Um, the first is, this is my second sector point, people are more important than the sector. So despite the fact the sector is what attracts, very often, the sector is what attracts investors, the truth is the sector doesn't matter that much. And I've seen Harvard studies on this and I've certainly seen in my own experience, many, many people make billions of dollars in pretty ordinary sectors. You know, they're selling wood 
or you know they're selling bricks, or you know they have a factory that makes the covers for mobile phones, or or, or whatever. They don't have to be amazingly extraordinary sectors. Uh, it's the people that run these companies that uh, um, that make all make all the difference. So uh, what you want to look at when you're buying a company is the people, the people, the people. So first of all, you want to look for past performance. So don't buy, or generally don't buy a company that has not shown great performance. Now what often happens is people do that and they get sucked in by the promise that things are going to be different. Now that can be true, but generally speaking, when you're parting with your own money, you don't want to uh, listen to what they're saying. You just want to look at how they're growing. So past performance is the best indicator. And also their past performance at other companies. Have they been successful in other things that they've done? Next, you want to look for enthusiasm. And that is critically important. Why? Two reasons. One, you want them fully motivated to work in the company that you're buying. Number two, being, as you guys well know, being an entrepreneur is, is so uh, arduous sometimes, it's, it's so full of obstacles and battles that unless you have an inherent enthusiasm for your business, then it's unlikely that you weather the extraordinary number of storms that you, you experience in, in the years that it takes to, to build a successful company. And enthusiasm is one of the best uh, weapons. You know, I think it was General Colin Powell who said, optimism is a force multiplier. Optimism is a force multiplier. Now, a force multiplier is an actual military term used in in order in strategy to try and uh, uh, isolate the advantages that you've got over your oppositions. And and here's one of the great generals of all time putting optimism right up there with firepower as a as a as a force multiplier. So very very important. Next is the systems orientation. The truth is that. You can have two types of business, folks. The one is a talent-based business, and the second is a systems-based business. Now, ideally, you should have both, but you'd be very surprised how many businesses look good, but in fact have grown primarily on the talent of individuals. And you don't want to buy a business like that, and you want to be very careful of businesses like that, because once the person with charisma and with intuition and, and chutzpah, you know, daring, leaves that company, then what have you got? You've got very little. You've got uh, uh, a company that, that may be bereft of systems. What you want to do is introduce systems so that, uh, as someone famous said, so that any idiot can run it because one day an idiot will. I so, actually think that as an entrepreneur, I remember Adrian Giles said this after he sold Hitwise and then he was terribly disappointed that the company didn't fall down in his absence until he suddenly realized that the best achievement of any entrepreneur in their entire life is the legacy that they leave behind, i.e. the business that runs without them. Uh, they're, 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 the, they're, the, they're the partners that you want to buy from. Yeah, well, that's a lovely thought, you know, and, 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 it, and it's, it's true that um, uh, ultimately that's the true test of, uh, of a company is, is and, and look at, you know, the great companies uh, that, didn't need people. Then there's companies like Apple that, you know, when Steve Jobs was there, it was pretty damn good. And then 20 years went, and Steve Jobs had to come back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's even big companies suffer from this same personality uh, 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 deficit problem. And then finally, make sure you get on with these people. A lot of people will buy a business when they don't get on with the people because the business is good, and it's it usually is to help because. Uh, they're on their best behavior when you, when you uh, when you buy them. Uh, once you once you bought them, then you uh, you know they start getting really bad. Uh, okay, quickly through the next uh, uh, parts about how to buy a company. Um, one of the best things Warren Buffett ever said, I, I think, is that he looks for what he calls a margin of safety. So when he acquires a business, he wants to make sure that it's so good that even if it doesn't live up to much of what the owner says it'll still be a good purchase. In other words, there's a margin of safety between what the company's worth and what he's paying. You can't nice. always get that. And, and, and Warren Buffett changed his uh, strategy somewhat 
about 20 years into his career. Uh, that's what you should aim for. Okay, if uh, let's look at a low, medium, and high scenario for for their future results. If if they just hit low, will this still be a reasonable purchase? Uh, next, earn out. You want to you want to as much as you can make them earn out, stay in the business. A so you can learn it. B so they're motivated. And finally, view a lot. Make sure you, a lot of people, amazing amount of people, will just uh, look at three businesses and buy one of them. You want to look at many, many, many businesses before you actually uh, purchase them. Okay, so that's how to how to buy a company. Next up, area three on the path to five hundred million is the right way to go public. And there's a great picture. <laughs> the right way to go public, whether you're having a piss or going on the ASX. Um, so. Here's a few thoughts about, you know, I've been involved in a number of um, uh, public companies and um, I got to see a number of interesting things. So if you aspire to going public, just keep these lessons in mind. The first is sell the story early. You know, what I was amazed at, when we first started our business, the stock market pretty soon crashed after the first dot-com uh, um, collapse. And uh, I can tell you, for the next three years, you couldn't raise money anywhere. No one wanted to know about any, any, pretty much any float. There was, there were, I think it was two years with almost no, no floats. But what was really interesting is the guy I opened the business with, who, who put up the money through uh, uh, his, his back, a Reg Grundy. This guy really understood public markets, and for two years, he went around telling people who were potential investors that we would eventually go public and this is what the company's like now and we'll see you in a few years. And he kept on doing that. And then sure enough in 2004, the markets got better and we were ready to float. Why? Because all these key investors, institutional funds, you know, managed fund, uh, 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 managed fund uh, managers uh, already knew about the company. They knew it had gone well, they watched it, they got used to it, they trusted the people at the top of it, and bang, now we're going to float. And uh, I think he raised $18 million in 48 hours uh, uh, leading up to the float because he sold the story early before he actually needed to float. Next, ideally what you want is you want to have, after you float, within a short period of time after the float, you ideally, not always, you want to have an acquisition. So you want to buy a company. Now, the reason you want to do that, it can be a small company, it doesn't matter. The reason you want to do that, if you can find a good one, is it gives you a quick growth story, a quick spurt of growth. So already this company's moving, the stock price will move, it's got momentum, people start watching it, uh, you know, all the mum and dad investors that are that are keen on stocks start seeing it move on the computer, people start writing it up in magazines, it's got energy behind it. And the, fast of, the fastest way of, of doing that is, is with an acquisition. Next up, you want to PR it strongly. See, I used to think that all these intelligent fund managers knew all about these companies, and the truth is, they don't. They've got so many companies they've got to watch. You've constantly got to be PRing your story. And so you either hire a PR person or you do the PR yourself, but you've got to be endlessly telling the press what you're about, endlessly telling the bloggers, endlessly telling the financial guys, the institutions, this is what we're about, this is where we're going, this is, this is who we are, PR, PR, PR. Because people buy that stuff, they really do, and if they haven't heard of a company, they're much less likely to invest in it. Next, uh, last two lessons for this section is, uh, first is always be raising. Now what do I mean by that? is you should constantly, if you're going to have a public company, and frankly even a private company, you've always got to have the next set of money ready to go. So, uh, you know, you, you've got to have two or three investors or institutions that are prepared to potentially give you millions so that when you need them, it's ready to go. The last time you, uh, place and moment you should be trying to raise money is when you need it. You've got to have it locked away early and very few people do that. And then finally, the right way to go public is you want to, when you um, uh, 
acquire companies, you at least, well it really depends, but I'm going to put a blanket uh, basic lesson uh, down here, probably at least 50% of your acquisition should be in your own company stock. You don't want to give away all your cash because your stock, it will keep rising if, you, if you've acquired it well. And they feel good because they've, bought, they've been paid in stock which has been rising largely as a result of their acquisition. And they're more likely to get excited and they're more likely to stay with the company. But also you haven't given away your valuable cash. So uh, that's another lesson to kind of have a think about uh, when it comes to taking your company public. Mm, the other thing about Alrighty. That. The other so thing about the, I was going to say the public started. I was going to say the other thing about an acquisition is that uh, is that when a com when you buy a company you got a listed company and you buy another company if it's if it's an unlisted company you might it might only have a value of a a a, a, a price earnings ratio of, of of about two or three but the moment that it's part of a listed company suddenly the valuations are much greater which means that on paper the company is suddenly much bigger for the amount of uh, money that you may have actually put in to buy that company, um, which means acquisitions oh, are exciting. But uh, to recap very quickly, yeah. I was also just thinking, so if we're talking about growth here, we've started off raise money. That's a great thing to do. If you want to accelerate your growth, buy a company. If you want to take it to the next level, IPO. But what's interesting is a lot of the advice from IPO could also be brought back to the idea of raising money in the first place, such as keep telling everyone your story and always know where your next round is coming from, and also buying a company, which once again you do when you when you list. It seems that there seems to be a cycle here. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, it's 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 not uh, rocket science, but it, I didn't know this stuff. I I found this stuff uh, out in experience, and and I just wish people had told me a little earlier that this is the way that things tend tended to work. Mm. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, next area is how to incline. So you know we're building momentum here, but at the end of the day, you can't just uh, generally you can't. Uh, uh, purely grow your company just by acquisitions. You've got to actually, once you've, once you're, you've got these companies, you've got to get them clients. So I just want to talk about a few ways to uh, win clients. Do we have a slide for that? Someone's just asked, what does IPO mean? Initial public offering. So somebody listing on a, on a stock exchange like the ASX or, um, or NASDAQ or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're, and that's what that means is you're offering stuff to the public. You're offering the company to the public, and because you're you floated, it's the first, for the first time initial public offering. Um, good point. Okay, so how to win clients? I'm going to give you three concepts here that I think are worth a fortune. Uh, the first one took me 17 years to learn. So I was 17 years in business before I understood this concept, and uh, my my ad agency at the time wasn't going well, and I was talking to a mate of mine about how uh, how to get more clients. I just couldn't get enough clients, and he he put me through to a guy called Justin Rolf Marsh, who is an expert at getting clients. And he had this really great principle, and he said, "Look, the problem is if you're selling a service, and these days about seventy percent of businesses are services." He said, "If you're selling a service, no doubt you've had this situation where." You uh, think you, you've done a good meeting with the client, and you you go, wow, you know what? We're going to get that business, and then you find. Uh, but the trouble is, you don't know whether you're going to get it tomorrow. They're going to call you up and say you got the business next week, next month, three months, six months, a year, two years, five years, and that was very much the case with me. I do these presentations, and then I'd uh, I'd wait and wait and wait, and I wouldn't get it. An answer. So it was a time issue. And then second of all, I often found that even though I did a good presentation, nine months later I'd find out some other company got the business. And I'm sure there's a lot of people actually uh, on the call who can who can relate to that. Well finally Justin Rolf Marsh explained to me why this occurred and it changed my, my business life forever. He said, here's the thing, it's not the best person who often wins the business. Well, certainly it's not the best person who necessarily gets on the short list. Often it's the person who most recently contacted the client. Mm. 
So they're looking for a, 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 a supplier at the time you call them, right? And that's what gets you on the shortlist and very often just gets you the business. And then the other area is the frequency. So if someone has been calling them regularly, then, uh, you know, let's say every month for a year, then when the client finally decides they want something, that person gets on the shortlist as well. So the key areas that determine getting on the shortlist, other than you being reasonably good, you can't be terrible, but just reasonably good, you don't have to be brilliant, it is recency and frequency. And that changed me forever because I never did that. I never stayed in touch with clients. And so what we did is we changed all our marketing so that maybe 16 times a year, clients or potential clients we're hearing from us. And we maybe send them a book or a postcard or a testimonial or a, a case study or a, you know, a t-shirt with our logo on it. It didn't really matter. But if, and, and obviously, you know, sporadic phone calls, so, you know, can we get on the shortlist, et cetera, et cetera. But this changed everything for us, folks. And if you just remember the concept of recency and frequency and design your new business efforts around constant contact, not in an irritating way, but just regular contact, then you're going to find you get on many, many more shortlists. So that's the first way to win clients. The second way is, the uh, uh, second concept is now, soons, and later. Some of the people, that if you look at the audience out there, the potential audience for your product or service, some people want it now. Some people don't want it now, but they, they may want it soon. And some people don't want it now or soon, but later on, maybe in two years' time, they want it. So you can map your new business efforts based on, okay, who are nows, who are soons, and who are laters. Now, what happens, i found, is most people only think about the nows. Who have we got now? Where can we get a client now? But you need to have a slower cultivation of clients. You need to, and this brings us to the third concept, move down a continuum. And the continuum is based on three words, know, like, and trust. First, they've got to know that you exist. But that's not enough. Most people try and get the sale at that point. So you see all these websites trying to sell you uh, this person's uh, product. But people won't buy it because they don't. But they don't have the second issue, which is trust. They don't. Oh, sorry, like. They don't like you yet. You've got to win them over. That takes time. They've got to understand your personality or really understand your offering. So the first part's no. The next part's like. And the third part along the continuing the continuum to sell something is trust. So finally, they trust you. I mean, we, we all like, like some people, but we wouldn't necessarily do business with them. We wouldn't necessarily give them our money. We've got to trust them as well. And that's a beautiful third model for you to evaluate your clients with now. How many know us? How many know us and like us? And now how many know us, like us, and trust us? And how can we move the knows down to the trust level? What can we do? Instead of trying to flog them stuff all the time, how can we instill, how can our, our authority, our knowledge, our wisdom, our sense of, of decency, these are all factors that are as important for getting someone to, someone to write a check as whether your product's any good. But most people don't behave that way. So those three concepts, recency and frequency, now, soon, and later, and no like trust, make a huge difference in how to sell uh, your um, uh, how to win over clients. Okay. Uh, hey, um, hey, uh, Simon. Um, a chap called yeah. Greg has just piped up. I once heard it takes three meetings to build trust. I, 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 everything that Simon's saying, I'm loving because it is so it is so true. But I actually find that it often takes up to seven touch points. If you touch someone seven times, they'll not only know you and hopefully like you, but they'll trust you and hopefully love you forever. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I well believe it. Mm. Um, you know, let's let's remember this, guys. It's not the quick sell, okay? It's uh, let's earn the right to have a customer for life. Here's a great quote quote for you from Dan Kennedy, and this is a beautiful quote. Um, he said, "The people, per, <laughs> most people, they get a customer in order to get a sale." 
So they get a customer in order to get a sale. He said, I get a sale in order to get a customer. And what does he mean by that? He says, what he really wants is, a, is somebody who for the next 30 years will buy from him. He's not after the sale, he's mm. after the customer. And that's a, a very smart distinction. Mm. Okay, so um, uh, level five, lead, uh, uh, leading a fast growth organization. So if you've done all those things, you're going to have a company that's growing fast, right? You've got all these clients coming in, you've got the capital, etc. So let me give you just a few points about this and, and uh, I'll try, James, I'll try and wrap it up in how many minutes do you think for this session? Ah, uh, 10 minutes, that will give us 10 minutes for question time. Beautiful, okay. So I want to give you a few, uh, three studies and then I'm going to talk about a few other things, okay? And these are very short studies. First one comes from Gallup, one of the largest research organizations in the world. This study was done on four million people who worked in companies, four million people. Guess what is the number one reason that people leave, staff, leave a company? Now, before you go on, Simon, anyone who's listening now, have a guess. Anyone who's listening now, got their fingers out, they want to type something, what's the number one reason that people leave companies? What do you think it is, Greg and Jordan and Darren and all these other names I'm seeing popping up in front of me? Managers seems to be the most popular. Dissatisfaction, unhappy with service, thank you, Ross. Underappreciated, Damien Foley. Lack of recognition or control, Jackie Taylor. No inspiration or leadership, indifference by management. There's some common themes there, Simon. Are they on track? You know what? I'm really impressed with the audience because none of you said money. <laughs> most true. people think that it's money that is going to keep their staff, but you guys are all right. Uh, it's, or, uh, it's lack of appreciation. It's the number one reason that staff leave a company. So if you want to grow a fast growth organization, the amazing news is you don't have to offer the highest salary. So people like Zappos that are you know, got wonderful places to work, they don't offer the highest salaries. What they do is they care for their staff. Their, their staff aren't just a unit of work that they manipulate, you know, like from you know some of those industrial era companies where these people were just running factories. Now we're in, we have a dire shortage of talent. So just caring for them, really caring for them, appreciating them, telling them when they've done a good job makes all the difference. But I can tell you that most people got, I think it was only 16% of workers have been told that they've done a good job in the last year. So no wonder mm, so terrible. many of them want to leave. So first one, appreciate, really appreciate your uh, staff. Uh, next way to lead a fast growth uh, organization, and let's, let's change the slide to fast growth organization if we can, hopefully. You yeah, say. there he is. <laughs> There he is, the man in an Australian, only, uh, <laughs> only time, one of the rare times you'll see someone in a kind of Australian outfit that will come first in the athletics, um, but it isn't, of course, it's Jamaica. Um, uh, the, the next study is the Cotter study. And this is a Harvard professor, John Cotter, uh, interesting guy. He, he did a study, he said, he said one overarching characteristic of uh, CEOs that be, and uh, you know, obviously you've got quiet CEOs, you've got loud CEOs. His um, answer was unequivocal. It's people with urgency. When a CEO, when a, a, a ruler of a company has a sense of urgency, the company tends to do really well. And that was the, despite the fact that many CEOs have different personalities, all successful CEOs behave with urgency. They've got to get it done now. No, we want it done now. No, we're not going to wait two months. We want it now. And that driving of people and driving of deadlines and driving of goals is, is the absolute common characteristic, according to all of Professor John Cotter's work at Harvard on successful CEOs. So I just want to map you, get yourself to map yourself out of 10 you know, where do you come 
with your own sense of urgency about you know growing your company. So uh, the third study is is a study done in 1970 by a guy called Edward Banfield. I love this study. Banfield wanted to know what is it, what is a single is there a single reason that people move up an economic level in life? So how do they become wealthier and move to a different uh, stratosphere of wealth? And so he did this um, long study and um, remarkable study when it came out because he found out that there really was one overarching characteristic and you know what it was? Long-term time perspective. So that was the number one characteristic of people who became really wealthy. The, he said, look, a lot of people who don't earn much they, or build much, they tend to think in, you know, what can I do with my money in the next few weeks or next few months? People who earn quite a lot, you know, what can I do in the next year, two, three years? People who earn a huge amount is what can I build in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, lifetime? They have longer time perspectives. Now, the problem is, you know, a lot of people are seeing all these articles on Facebook and Instagram and stuff and they think, wow, you know, if I haven't made a billion dollars in the first few years, I'm a failure. But all the stats say the opposite. Almost every major company on the planet grew slowly at first until they got it all right. And I mean, I can give you countless studies, but let me just give you one example. Walmart uh, is an example. It employs more people than anyone else on the planet, 2.1 million people. It was seven years in as a business before Walmart even opened its second store. And they weren't big stores, they were just out in country towns. So if the, the world's number one employer can start out like that, then don't be so discouraged by whatever uh, speed you're growing your business, because the truth is, it's just a matter of getting the code, the combination right. And when you've got it right, then, and you've built solid foundations, you haven't, you know, rushed things, then you will, you know, you've got the foundation to build something really extraordinary. So here's the, here's the paradox, so you have, a, you have to have an attitude of urgency, but then you have to fully expect that it's going to take a while. So, uh, a few more thoughts before we finish up for questions. Um, the, the first is, fun makes money. It's been my experience, and this is an interesting one, when I ran a business where I put fun first, I made, generally speaking, more money than when I ran a business just to make money. I don't know what it was, maybe because we had a better vibe for clients or we had more enthusiasm or because it was fun and we worked longer, but that's what I found. I found that uh, when I put fun, when I valued fun, then, then more money was made. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs who create fun atmospheres that have done really well. So be careful not to buy into this view that you've got to be always grinding it out you know, uh, emotionally. You, you know, if you have a bit of fun, you know, you can, uh, uh, you can often find, maybe usually find, that you'll end up with a bigger business than, than if, you, if you feel like it's got to be hard. And then I, I just want to finish on one last tip for uh, uh, leading a, a fast growth organization. And I call this the, the three-way steal. So you've got to become a master of the three-way steal. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean stealing ideas because you can, there's two ways you can you achieve a lot. You can come up with a lot of ideas yourself that other people haven't thought of, which is definitely what you should do, but it is hard and it takes time. Or you can just steal ideas from other people who've been successful. So uh, there's three ways of stealing. The first is you've got to steal from the best in your industry. Now, in order to do that, you've got to know who the best in your industry are. So there's no one on this call who's got a business that shouldn't know, okay, who is, the, let's say I'm, I'm in carpet cleaning, who are the best people in carpet cleaning, who are the companies that are growing fastest, who are the ones that we see everywhere that seem to really be scoring runs, and how can I steal ideas from them, steal how they structure their, their pricing, their their uh, marketing, their website, their, their emphasis in the sales process. 
steal from the best. Now, I don't mean word for word, I just mean their a lot of their general concepts. And if you tend to do similar things to the brand leader, then you, you often find that you become, um, maybe not the brand leader, but you become much more successful. So that's the first one, steal from, from your own industry. Second steal is steal from the best in the world. It does amaze me that how many people own businesses can't tell me who's the best in their profession in America, or who's the best in England, or who's the best in Asia, who's the best in Europe, who's the best in South Africa. Let me tell you, when I was owning, uh, when I owned ad agencies, I mean, I knew all those places. I knew who the best was in Brazil. I knew who the best was in Japan. I studied the best outside uh, my own country. Why? Because often you can grab stuff from them and you can just apply it and you'll be the only one in your country that's even doing it. And it works. I mean, John McGrath is a classic example in real estate. Here's a guy who every year used to, even when he didn't have much money, he would fly over to the American uh, real estate conferences, take their best ideas and instill them into Australia and ended up making a fortune as a result of that. And the final uh, steal of the three-way steal is steal from other industries. You know, it's unbelievable what you can take from other industries. I, I took a lot on how to sell from the real estate industry. Uh, I know a real estate, uh, one of the best real estate agents in America, he took a lot of his stuff from the meat processing industry. Other people will take things from the retail industry and apply it to their corporation, you know, how to department stores sell and maybe you could do the same. You know, maybe you could pick up the phone in the same way that FedEx pick up the phone, which is within one ring no matter where you are in the world. You've got to steal from the best industries because you, you just it's so easy, you just transport a few good ideas into your industry and you're often the only person who's doing it. So they're the three steals and that pretty much brings us up to, to uh, my deadline. Uh, they're my five, uh, five ways to uh, get to a $500 million business. That was, a, that was amazing, Simon. I, I, I love that fun makes money. <laughs> I think that I think that, that, that is that is how my business has been built and and, and, and I and I do know it. Um I sometimes think I have the best job in the world because I get to do webinars like this and busy busily take note um of all the interesting things that you've said. On that last note, um I heard I heard an expression that I use often, imagination is largely determined by experience. We all think imagination is something that comes from I don't know, um sort of like you know, inner brilliance. But often it actually, imagination is largely limited by the things that we've done. So if I said, imagine you're on a tropical island, you can tell me what you see. If I say, imagine you're on the 42nd moon of Jupiter, you might struggle because you've never been to the 42nd moon of Jupiter. And the reason why I say that is because all these other industries are doing things that you can't imagine. Um, you, 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 know, you, um, you know, imagine if Cochlear decided to look at the entertainment industry for a second. Imagine if the entertainment industry decided to look at cochlear, but uh, but no, you know they're not they're not stealing each other's ideas, so uh, so they don't move as forward as they can, as fast as they can. Yeah. Now we've got some people screaming um, praise at you, uh, Simon, coming in here. Thank you for your time and generosity of experience, with lots and lots of capital letters. Um, Mark, can I have the next slide before we get on to questions? Hello. Oh, there we go. That's a nice picture. It's not the one I expected. Um, <laughs> what's the slide after that? Vicky's, wow, this Vicky's is just yelled in brilliant stuff. Thanks, Simon and James. Um, what a Great. charming and inspirational person you are, Simon. Thank you so much. That was Melinda Nugent. Such thanks. a polite people. What a fabulous opportunity to be part of this webinar. Many thanks, Simon. Uh, that's Ignacio Incuasta. I'm really sorry if I didn't get that quite right. Jordan Mullen, again, great. Um, no BS advice. Brilliant stuff. Thanks, Simon and James, Vicky Ravi. Gee, there's lots of people asking question, uh, uh, saying wonderful things. Does anyone have a question in the two minutes that we have before we sign up? This is your chance. Can I have $5 million for a venture? No, Jordan, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks, Simon and James. That was excellent exclamation mark, Wendy Fastia. More thank yous, more thank yous. All right, um, 
We don't have any uh, final last minute questions. That's okay. You only had one minute anyway, so we got to go. But thank you so much, Simon. Thanks for uh, thanks for logging in from um, from New York. Um, what are the colours of the New York State Building, the Empire State Building, right now? Oh, guys, it's all it's almost totally white at the moment, and there's a, a like a little pink light at the top. So it's uh, it's looking pretty statuesque, I must yeah. say. It's it's the classic look. It's the classic look. Well, it's great. Well, thank you so much, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Signing off. My absolute pleasure, James. And thanks, everybody.